Welcome to the Debate Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Well, uh, thank you for joining us this morning again. We, today, we are delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Diana Millewix. She's the President George Bush Chair of Cardiovascular Medicine at UT Houston, University of Texas, Houston. She's also the Director of the Division of Medical Genetics and the Vice Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine at that institution. Dr. Millewick's research program focuses on identifying rare variants in genes that trigger vascular diseases and understanding the link between the altered gene and the disease using cellular and mouse models of the mutant genes. She originally focused, and she's very well known for this, on genes for thoracic aortic, dissect, uh, thoracic aortic aneurysms and acute aortic dissections. But most recently, she has pers pursued the identification of genetic variants that leads to a large artery occlusive cerebrovascular disease. She has received numerous honors and awards for her research, including the Princess Lillian Foundation Award in Belgium, the American Heart Association Merit Award, and Rice University Distinguished Alumni Award. She has been inducted to the American Society of Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians. For us to care for patients uh, with aortopathies, Dr. Millewick's seminal work has guided us for several decades to improve the care and outcomes of our patients. Dr. Millewick, the stage Thank is you. yours. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that nice in, um, introduction. I'm very happy to be here to give grand rounds. I'm going to focus my talk today mostly on thoracic aortic disease and acute aortic dissection and really um, emphasize where, uh, how ideal this particular disease is for gene-based management, that so-called precision medicine, and really provide you examples how if we understand what the causative gene is in an individual with thoracic aortic disease, and even down to the individual variant they have, that that dictates how we manage them. Um, in addition to helping us figure out who's at risk for this disease in the general population. So for many years I've been working on this disease, thoracic aortic aneurysms involving the root and ascending aorta. Um, progressively enlarge over time. They tend to be asymptomatic. Many people don't know they have a risk for aortic dissection until the dissection actually occurs. And one of the reasons that I work on this disease is because um, those acute aortic dissections, our best data right now says almost half the people that have a dissection don't make it to the hospital and die of um, mostly pericardial tamponade. Even if they make it to the hospital, it's a surgical emergency and there's a death rate associated with uh, that surgical repair. But if we can figure out who's at risk and um, we can follow the aneurysms and then go in and repair the aorta in a timely manner to prevent the acute type A dissections. And we know from, you know, from John Elefteriotis' work that we can watch the aorta grow to five, five and a half centimeters, go in and repair it. But if you flip it around and look at people who present with dissections in the AR, 60% um, of them have diameters less than 5.5 uh, centimeters. So there's a little bit of a paradox in the field that we don't understand why are these people dissecting at a much smaller diameter. And genetics really informs that also. So as a geneticist, um, somebody who's doing cardiovascular genetics, this is a, a dream disease to study because if you identify somebody at risk, you can really prevent that bad outcome if they're managed properly. And um, we all know about Marfan syndrome and, this, and the systemic features. We've known about it since the late 1800s when it was first described. 
And then the cardiovascular manifestations, the risk for aortic aneurysms leading to type A dissections, and a low risk for type B, those descending dissections, are um, there in patients with Marfan syndrome, and they were described in about the 1950s. So we've studied this disease for a long time. We know that they present with aortic root aneurysms, less than 10% will present with a type B dissection. We can treat them with beta blockers or ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, and the current meta-analysis says that if they can tolerate it, we should be treating them with both drugs. Um, but remember, neither one of these drugs prevent dissections. So they slow the growth of the aneurysms, but ultimately we have to send them to surgical repair. The current treatment guidelines that were just published in the fall and updated of the 2010 guidelines suggest repair at five centimeters at a center of excellence. And we know after we repair the, ace the aortic root and ascending aorta, um, they are at a risk for type B dissection. We're still trying to define that and why that risk is still there. And, but they're at a very low risk to have aneurysms like intracranial aneurysms or pop, you know, femoral artery, off, uh, artery aneurysms. And what we realized after um, finding the gene for Marfan syndrome, which is the FBN1 gene, that there were many people in our clinic that looked Marfanoid but instead, um, but did not have a mutation in that FBN1 gene. And they, we went on to show that many, that those individuals, many of them, will have mutations in genes for the TGF beta signaling pathway. And um, they initially were uh, labeled, the first gene identified was TGFBR2, and uh, it was labeled Marfan syndrome 2 because of the fact many of these patients do look like they have Marfan syndrome, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, Lois and Dietz found TGFBR1. Us and another group found SMAD3. I, my group also found TGFB2, and the most recent one was TGFB3. They've all fallen under this label of Lois Dietz syndrome, and um, and the common features really do overlap a lot with Marfan syndrome, they including the skeletal features, the root aneurysms, and that autosomal dominant inheritance, which means somebody has one normal gene, one mutant, with a 50-50 chance of passing it on to their children. But we know there's specific um, features with this disease, and, um, and it's different from Marfan syndrome in that they go on to have aneurysm and dissections of other arteries. The current recommendation is head to pelvis imaging every two years to check for aneurysms and dissection. Um, we also know there's some features that are specific for some of these genes that kind of gets lost when they're all put under one un umbrella. Same problem we have with Ehrlos-Danlos syndrome. Um, that TGFBR1 and 2, the severe end of the spectrum, can present with craniosynostosis and cleft palate. The, the joint disease is much more severe in SMAD3. And there is a peripheral neuropathy that develops with age in SMAD3 patients. And my patients over the age of 80 with SMAD3 mutations are in wheelchairs due to this peripheral neuropathy. So it can be pretty significant. So here's, if I just take one of these genes, TGFBR2, and if you just look at the patients, you can tell that there is a wide range of clinical presentation with this disease. At one end, you have what was originally described as the lowest Dietz syndrome, the kids with the craniosynostosis, the hypertelorism, and they'll have cleft feet and cleft palates, and they will go on to have pretty early onset dissections, even in childhood. Um, here is a patient that looks that met the diagnostic criteria for Marfan syndrome, and um, but instead has a TGFBR2 mutation. So if you see somebody like this, uh, you don't know if they have Marfan syndrome or a TGFBR beta gene mutation until you do the genetic testing. And it does have implications for how we manage them, both in terms of when we send them to surgery and then that risk for additional aneurysms and dissections. 
And then finally, at the far end of the spectrum, you have people that look completely normal that have TGFBR2 mutations. I have patients in their 80s that have not had surgery or a dissection with TGFBR2 mutations. So we've got this wide range, and I'll get back to our work on really defining which mutations lead to this disease where we have to be aggressive in childhood, do lots of imaging, and which genes lead to this end of the spectrum. Because once again, this is all mutations in TGFBR2, but there are different mutations within the genes. So uh, one thing I just, I want to make some notes about what the genes are telling us about the molecular pathogenesis. Um, for many, many years, it was felt um, that too much TGF-beta signaling was the driver of thoracic aortic disease. And in, in fact, losartan was used to specifically block TGF-beta signaling as a treatment. And this is just a cartoon of the TGF-beta signaling. The two, T, the ligands bind, we have th um, three different genes that encode um, three different ligands of TGF-beta. The type 1 and type 2 receptors bind to that ligand, come together, and trigger downstream signaling, which includes phosphorylation of SMAD3 and, and SMAD3 and SMAD4, binding to SMAD4, and then it moves into the nucleus to trans change to transcription. And with these mutations, we are hitting ev almost every single protein in this canonical TGF-beta signaling. So we hit um, TGF-beta ligand 2 and 3, both receptors, SMAD3, SMAD4, and we published data on SMAD2, but the data is still questionable as to what the phenotype is associated with that gene. Um, and the real, uh, the thing that really turned the field completely upside down is the fact that uniformly these are loss of function mutations. They either cause hapless insufficiency where you have one normal gene and one gene that's not making any protein, so you just have the normal amount. And we showed with the TGFBR2 mutations, which are all down here in this intracellular part of the protein, that it disrupts the signaling, starting that downstream signaling, and they're all loss of function mutations. So once this also um, led to a real paradox in the field that we're still addressing in terms of what the role of TGF-beta signaling in this disease, but it's clear if you don't have enough TGF-beta signaling during development and in the early years, it will, you will have this disease, and if you have it secondarily, like if we block TGF-beta early in development, that you will have more disease. Um, so um, when I first arrived at Houston, in Houston many years ago, um, I was curious. We, I had worked on identifying FBN1 um, as the causative gene for Marfan syndrome. But I was curious as to whether there was a genetic predisposition beyond that. And so we did a very simple clinical study. I sent a genetic counselor to get family histories from actually patients at Methodist at that time and at Memorial Hermann. And um, these were patients that were coming in for aortic, thoracic aortic repair, ascending or root repair, or patients that presented with a type A or type B dissection. And it turns out that one out of five of those patients had a history, had another family member that was affected. And when we pulled, started collecting these families, we found that many of them had clear autosomal dominant inheritance of a risk for dissection, and that um, there was a variable age of onset, oftentimes, and decreased penetrance. And that's shown at this, in this woman. And she had a... Um, completely normal imaging of her aorta, and despite that, had two children that both um, had dissections. Um, she actually had started to have slowly growing aneurysms, aneurysm in her 70s, and actually dissected about a 4.5 aorta at the age of 85 in her dance class, <laughs> and survived and went back to dancing, fortunately. <laughs> But that sort of late onset or decreased penetrance is very common in women in our family, families. 
And I'm going to go on and just show you some examples of the variability of the presentation of aortic disease in the families. So we started recruiting these families to define all the genes. Here's a family. This individual got life flighted to Houston with a type A dissection, 8 centimeter aortic root. His uncle uh, had, had a big aorta that was being followed that was growing very slowly. It had been followed over about 10 years and it was about 5.5 at that at the time this family entered our study. Um, and we imaged everybody, picked up a large number of asymptomatic aortic root aneurysm, sent this generation to surgical repair with aneurysms between 5.5 and 6.5. But, you know, this gene is predicting a slowly growing aneurysms that can get pretty big before they dissect. Whereas in this family, these individuals um, affected all have type A dissections with no enlargement of the aorta. So, and we still have not found the gene for this family. So the only thing we have to offer them is prophylactic repair. And we have done that for like this individual here. Once the aorta, he formed a true aneurysm, which was about 4.2. So we used our families um, to map and identify many of the genes that we now know cause this predisposition for thoracic aortic disease. And I sort of, and you'll see at the top is fibrillin 1. There are families that have just a risk for thoracic aneurysms and dissection without the skeletal or the ocular features of Marfan syndrome. You can see all these TGF beta receptor genes are on this list. I showed you an example of somebody that didn't look syndromic that had a TGFBR2. The first family I talked about, about the woman that was 80, that in her 80s when she dissected, that family actually has a SMAD3 variant. And I didn't mention it, but her son was about my height and about 300 pounds. So he was almost the anti when he dissected. It's almost the antithesis of what you think of a Marfan patient. And then finally down here is a series of genes identified my, by my lab that all affect smooth muscle cell contraction. And, and I just want to mention um, what these genes and these genes down here, those extracellular matrix proteins, and the contractile proteins are, may be telling us about the pathogenesis of this disease. So we are disrupting when we're just, uh, genes that encode um, the major structural components of the contractile unit in smooth muscle cells and the kinases that control that contraction. So ACTA2 includes smooth, the smooth muscle specific alpha actin and it polymerizes to form these actin filaments and the mutations we've shown disrupt the ability of the, 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 these uh, polymers to be made. We have mutations in the mice and heavy chain that's specific for smooth muscle cell. Once again, the filaments are not made. We have uh, loss of function mutations in the kinase that phosphorylates that little regulatory um, chain that sits and um, controls the movement of the myosin head. And we have gain of function uh, mutations in the protein that controls the phosphatase, such that these lead to less phosphorylation of that regulatory light chain. And these, the PRKG1 mutations, lead to e um, increased dephosphorylation. And the end result is decreased force development. But remember, the smooth muscle cells can't contract properly unless they're holding on to the matrix. And they do that um, through connection to microfibrils, and the major protein in those microfibrils is fibrillin 1. So overall, if you look at the mutations, the extracellular matrix, you really come up with um, uh, some that loss of that ability of the smooth muscle cell to generate force is the underlying pathogenesis of this disease. And we think that the cells have to, ha to have, be able to generate a homeostatic force. And if they can't, they start upregulating pathways to try to do that and because uh, they sense there's a problem with the aorta. And those pathways are what leads to aneurysms and dissections. And the nice thing about this pathway is the major risk factor for this disease is hypertension. And it may be that in that case, there's not defects in any of these components, but instead there's just more 
pressures across um, the cell and that en ends up upregulating the same pathways. And we, uh, re I recently got in, with, in conjunction with Toru Suzuki and other investigators a Leluc Foundation Award to really address specifically this and focusing in on that connection between the elastic fibers that goes down to the microfibrils, the integrins, and into the um, the contractile uh, filaments, and that connection is all through focal adhesions. And the goal of this LODUC is really to get better drugs for this disease. Like I said, we even the data on beta blockers and losartan is not that good in terms of slowing aortic growth, and neither one of them prevent dissections. We have no drugs that prevent dissections. So, um, and I just want to mention those TGF-beta genes, they control the ability of the smooth muscle cells to make the components of the contractile unit, the extracellular matrix. So when you have loss of function, you're actually making less of those components. So once again, even the TGF-beta genes, we can say that they, uh, they will contribute to activation of this pathway. And then I just want to talk about one story that came out of the ACTA2 genes, um, ACTA2 mutations, um, that really indicates once again how we have to move to gene specific management for this disease. ACTA2 uh, mutations do not cause syndromic features. Here's a woman that had a dissection after giving birth to her child there and she has an ACTA2 mutation and you would never be able to pick her out from the general population as to, be, as to whether or not she has a risk for dissection. She had one risk factor clinically. Can anybody guess what it was? Her father died of dissection. She had a family history of the disease. So remember that. You have to ask that family history if you help to get, identify people in the general population. Um, and, the, and the fact that in our, our, our clinical data that 90% of patients with ACTA2 mutations present with type A dissection, that data really tells us that people are not ask, asking family histories and are not picking up these families that lack syndromic features. Um, so when this was the family we used to map and identify the gene, and here everybody in black has thoracic aortic disease. Once again, every single one of them presented with a type A or type B dissection. And some of these were very young, age 13, whereas others were later onset. And everybody in orange has the mutation. So you can see the mutations going, is causing the dissection, but there's a lot of people in the family that have no disease, that decreased penetrance that I was talking about. And when I recruited this family, I actually flew to where they are because these, given the large number of genes that we have, um, these families really give us the genetic power to map and identify the genes. And so um, I, was, I went there to examine the family members and talk to them about the consent and so on. And at the end of the, uh, the talk, um, in, in an auditorium like this at their local ho hospital, this individual got up and said, you know, there's a lot of early onset coronary artery disease in my families, and could it be the same gene? I said, no, I don't think so. You know, one, the artery gets bigger, the other, the artery gets blocked, and it's two different biologic processes. So I don't think the same gene, you know, unlike Lois Dietz syndrome, where it is the same gene that can cause aneurysms and dissections elsewhere. Um, and it turned out, once we found the gene, the, that I was wrong. We actually went back, based on some other observations we were making in our families, we went back and got all the data on our families. And, and now everybody with early onset coronary artery disease due to atherosclerosis are in red. And you can see now that those individuals that didn't have disease, many of them have early onset coronary artery disease. This is very early onset. This individual had his first heart attack at the age of 33 with no cardiovascular risk factors. And the same, at the same time, so this is a mutation called, where an arginine's changed to a cysteine at position 149. 
But with other mutations, we saw something very different. In this family, we were reporting out the mutation to this family here, and just two weeks before we reported the mutation, this young girl here had an ischemic stroke. And when they imaged her, she had a pattern that's consistent with Moya Moya disease. And that's where the carotid arteries are wide open. But once the distal internal carotid artery goes into the brain, it becomes, it's occluded or stenotic bilaterally. And this is actually her imaging. So you can see here with this particular variant, a different variant that disrupts our gene 258, that you can have aortic disease in black or this Moya Moya-like disease um, in, in green. And after we, um, so despite having uh, very strong statistical evidence that ACTA2 mutations were causing thoracic aortic disease, coronary artery disease, and this Moya Moya-like cerebrovascular disease, it was really hard to get that paper published. And we had even found um, mutations in patients and in, in cohorts with early onset coronary artery disease and in cohorts with Moya Moya disease. But after I published the paper, I got contacted by children around and families and physicians uh, about children that had onset of Moya Moya starting as young as two years of age and aortic disease in their early teens, all of them have exactly the same mutation, and it's de novo, it's new. It occurs new in, the, in these individuals. And it's ACTA2 disruption of arginine 179. So you can see this very tight genotype-phenotype correlation that knowing the, the gene, the exact change, will tell you whether the patient's gonna get coronary artery disease or Moya Moya disease or have this really early onset progressive vascular disease. And all these children die before the age of 30, either of, um, of strokes or um, aortic disease or the other problem they get is pulmonary hypertension, not surprisingly, once again, a vascular occlusive disease. So we've been working, you know, I described this 10 years ago. We've been working over the past 10 years to try to figure out why mutations in one gene can cause all these different vascular diseases. Working on a hypothesis that the contractile problems lead to the aortic disease in the large elastic arteries. But the, the cells, and we have uh, a lot of data to support this, the mutations cause increased migration and proliferation of the smooth muscle cells and that they can trigger these two diseases. And we have a series of papers coming out in the next few months on how that this arm of the, the pathogenesis works. I'm just going to say I'd love to come back and talk about that, but we get very molecular, and I don't think this is a molecular audience. But that tells us we are starting a clinical trial to treat the Moya Moya disease because uh, we have some ancient agents that will block it in our mouse models. And then the coronary artery disease, our data says starting statins, very young, at high doses may prevent the atherosclerosis in these patients. So um, stay tuned. That should come out within the next month, the coronary artery disease story. So I think I've, con I've tried to convince you that if we know the gene and the variant, it'll help prevent, you know, really prevent, predict what's going on with the patient. But how do we actually put together the data to prove that and, and be able to really move this into precision medicine? So myself and, uh, um, and Reed Peretz and uh, uh, Dr. Guillaume Jandou in Paris launched the International Montalcino Aortic Consortium. A family in Canada, very wealthy family, offered to have the first um, meeting in, in Montalcino in Tuscany in their villa, and they, gave, they, they provided a lot of wine from their vineyard, <laughs> Brunello. So I named it the Montalcino Aortic Consortium, or MAC. I don't know if Apple's <laughs> gonna come after me or not. But um, to encourage them to continue to 
to fund and have the meetings there, which they have done. We have been back there three times now, only disrupted by COVID. So we started this international um, consortium to collect clinical data from busy aortic centers on patients with mutations in these genes. And I'm just going to show you the data on the first the, on the, the first thousand patients in the cohort. Um, that have mutations in the genes in red because those are the high numbers that we had. And this data was published um, in the fall in Jack. Um, so here's, if you look, and we, I've really taken it and for these um, presentation, I'm grouping the TGF beta genes separate from these smooth muscle contractile genes. So if we look overall at the age of onset of an aortic event, which we define as a pre presenting with a type A or type B dissection, or coming in for repair of an aneurysm. If you look at the average age of the entire 1,000 patients, um, that 50% come in by around age 50 on average. But then if we start breaking it down based on the individual gene, as we go from gene to gene, the statistical differences between every single gene. So if we look at the, the um, TGF beta genes here, you can see um, that for SMAD3 in blue and TGF B2, there are later onset and no real childhood events. So already clinically, we know if you have a patient with SMAD3 or TGFB2, you don't really need to be that aggressive during childhood. And the guidelines say image to get baseline just to make sure there's not a second hit or something bizarre going on. And then just very limited imaging until they're in their 20s. But here with TGFB or one and two, you can see that we have a fair number of uh, patients with childhood onset. So in that case, we want to look more carefully as to whether the specific changes will help prevent the disease. And here is just the, those TGFBR2 variants that I talked about earlier in the presentation. And if we take the variants where we have at least 10 unrelated patients with that variant and look at the age of onset, we can start really picking out those that lead to really early childhood onset and those that lead to later onset. And then here is all the other variants. So we have a lot of variants that still lead to childhood onset that we just don't have enough patients yet to really um, start breaking them up in terms of which are early onset um, because it really falls between these late onset and those early onset diseases. And I want to say that this particular mutation can be very aggressive in terms of its um, progression of vascular disease, and, but if you treat it aggressively surgically, that they can do quite well. Um, this is a patient that was actually followed over at St. Luke's, that by the age of 17, he had his ascending and arch repaired, and he went on to, to have a type B dissection and rapid degeneration, so had that repaired, and then continued to have aneurysms that involved all of his great arteries. Not shown here, oh, there it is. There he started to have uh, aneurysms of his mesenteric artery also. So these patients take, require very aggressive disease. And like I said, that late onset, you know, I pay patients in their 80s that haven't had an aortic event yet. So um, once again, this is looking at the gene, but even dr drilling down to the individual mutations. And the same is true for those smooth muscle contractile genes. PRKG1 um, is the early onset, earliest onset overall of, dice, of um, aortic events of any of the genes. And once again, the vast majority of these patients present with dissections, and I'll be talking more about that in a mi minute. The myosin night chain kinase is the latest onset, and ACTA2 falls between. And then uh, once again, if you take the ACTA2 variants, that arginine 179, those kids with de novo mutations, you can see that they're very early onset and uh, severe, where others are later onset. 
and I just want to mention there's lots in the data that um, I don't understand but are great um, uh, signals for future research. Here's the two TGFBR1 and 2 mutation, um, uh, data on the, those mutations. Those two receptors come together to trigger downstream signaling. And with TGFBR1, we see dramatic differences based on sex, with men having much more earlier onset and more penetrant disease than the women, whereas TGFBR2, we don't see that at all. So why is that? I mean, it may tell us something about the disease overall, which is, tends to be male, slightly more male predominant. And then I just want to give you an example how we can use this data for precision medicine, and sometimes that can be very aggressive management. Here's a, uh, um, this mother here with their daughter shown here. Um, this family uh, has a PRKG1 mutation, like I said, the most overall, the most earliest onset of disease. Um, the mother had lost her husband to type A dissection at 35, her eldest son at 23. Um, we found the gene and reported it back, and um, both these children, including this daughter there, had the PRKG1 mutation. So this um, son here was being imaged very routinely, and what we know about PRKG1 is that they have type A dissections with no or minimal enlargement of the aorta. He had an aortic um, root I mean, the aortic root of 3.2 centimeters at the age of 19, and three months later, he died of dissection. And so the question came up, what do we do with the 17-year-old? And she actually had a four centimeter aorta. So the decision was made to go in and repair her. Number one, I don't show it here, but there's no sex difference with this particular gene, so we can't delay it based on that. We don't have a really good marker, and if we did, she was already showing enlargement. And here's our clinical data. If we look at people presenting with dissections they, with PRKG1, the dissections are in pink and the aneurysm repair is in blue. This is the exact opposite of the way it should be. So people, if they don't dissect, they have these slow-growing aneurysms, but they're at a risk for both type A and type B dissections. And so in this case, our recommendations are um, treat them aggressively and begin to talk about uh, repair of the ascending aorta even as young as 18 years of age, 17, 18 years of age, especially if they have some enlargement of the aorta. So, um, and I just wanna say that our data has also been used to define those surgical thresholds for TGFBR, um, the lowest deeds patients, and these are all in the treatment guidelines, so I won't go into those. But TGFB2 and SMAD3, uh, they tend to be more like Marfan patients. ACTA2, TGFBR1, and um, TGFBR2, the threshold was lowered to 4.5 because of a real burden of dissections. And then PRKG1, I already talked about that. So these are all in the guidelines. And I wanna say that um, we have this MAC data, it continues to grow, and the next thing we're working on is really defining those other aneurysms and dissections in patients with the TGF-beta pathway mutations, those low steets, because right now um, the feeling is that the doing um, imaging every two years is, is overly aggressive. So we're really trying to defi define what are the arterial events, where are they occurring, are there gender difference? And I can tell you across the board, women are at a higher risk for having other aneurysms and dissection. And if they smoke, the risk goes way up. So this data we're just finishing up for publication. So in the, just the last few minutes, I've been talking about this, you know, uh, the, the individuals and families that have a high, uh, one single gene altered, a mutation or pathogenic variant, 
um, that confers this very high risk for aneurysms and dissections. And um, that's only 20% of the people that come in with thoracic aortic disease. And we really want to know what's going on in these patients so we can identify people like Grant Wall. He had his type A dissection when he was covering the World Cup and ended up dying in Qatar. And fortunately, they got his body to New York City and um, and the morgue there actually does genetic testing for aortopathies and dissection cases. And so, stay tuned is all I'm gonna say. I can't say anything yet. <laughs> and I think everybody in this room should know who this is. <laughs> he actually had his type A dissection, 94, is that right? Yeah, which is totally ironic, because mm -hmm. he and Cooley pioneered the repair of a type A dissection. The first successful repair Anybody know? 1956, and it was a Rice professor that dissected, that came right over, and Denton and I mean, uh, Cooley and DeBakey were co-authors on that paper. So, and they made the, they were sewing the graphs at home, by the way. They were still trying to figure out the best graphs to put in. Anyway, and he, uh, I, you guys all know the DeBakey story, so I won't go into that. So we uh, have been working to really you know, we're not going to solve the problem of people dying of dissection until we really address what's going on in those 80% of patients. So I'll give you what we have up to date. We still don't have anything ready for, uh, uh, you know, to go out into the population. Those genome-wide association studies, we've been pursuing those, and that's where you're looking for common variants that are in the population and trying to see if any of them um, increase the risk. But this is not like a gene mutation. It's like a, they usually are under a twofold increased risk. And um, our first GWAS study, here's all the, those addresses or markers we use throughout the chromosome. This is called a Manhattan plot because you're looking for a, an association with one of these street addresses that leads to a peak or a tall building on the plot. And our first peak fell right on top of FBN1. So first of all, we knew we were probably right about this. And second of all, it's, you know, most of the studies in terms of drug trials are done in Marfan patients. And um, this really tells us that the pathogenesis overlaps between Marfan syndrome. And we've gone on with, um, and to collaborate with um, groups at Stanford and Penn to use the Million Veterans Program to do further GWAS. Once again, even if we put all these together, it's not clinically useful. And so if we look at either ascending or descending or dissection, we can find these variants, but it doesn't help us clinically. Interesting, FBN1 shows up on every single one, even descending thoracic aortic aneurysms, which kind of surprised me, those sort of degenerate aneurysms that appear late in life. And then we, so I still believe that there's rare variants that increase the risk. And so if you have one of those rare variants and then you're hypertensive, you're the person that's gonna have a dissection. Or you can put two of those variants together and we've shown that in both cases we can model those in, in mouse models. So we have taken cohorts of patients with early onset dissections under the age of 60 with the hope of really enriching for these these low penetrant, low risk genes. And um, if we take a cohort under the age of 56, or we've repeated this under the age of 60, um, almost 10% have, and these are people, no family history, no syndromic features, none of those Marfan LDS patients. 10% still have a mutation in a known gene, but 30% have a variant in the gene that we cannot classify as benign and that are, are statistically, it's great, these variants are greatly enriched in patients with disease. So we think even in those known genes, there's variants that confer a low risk, and it's not high enough that it, it goes from one generation to the next, but it's a low risk variance. And once again, watch for the Grant Rawl story to come out because, um, Okay, so um, in terms of clinical recommendations, all patients with thoracic aortic disease, and these are straight out of the guidelines that, that were published in the fall, they should be informed about the risk to family members, 
John Ritter, I think I've had one slide with his face on there. After his death, we imaged the family members. His brother had an aneurysm, got repaired at Stanford, still alive today. And so that, that an aneurysm or a dissection really can be a red flag that there's other family members at risk. We're recommending genetic testing in anybody that has those morphinoid, has aortic disease, but has those morphinoid or LDS features. If there's a family history of the disease, remember, you could be that you're, you're seeing somebody in your clinic that wants to get pregnant and their father died of dissection and she has a normal aorta, not, let's say the father had a dissection and survived and she has a normal aorta, you want to go after the father, not her, and find, see if the father has a mutation or not. But re one really important factor in genetic testing is we don't know all the genes. We can only solve about 40% of the families. And so we still have a way to go. Um, and um, the, those individuals, we recommend genetic testing in aor uh, patients with aortic dissection under 60. And once the gene and the variant is known, we recommend gene-based management for that individual in terms of what other vascular disease you're looking for and how frequently to image for that, when to do the surgical repair, and so on. Now, you guys are all busy physicians. And to dig that out of the literature is difficult. So we've actually have a, we're beta testing an app where you put the gene in and the variant and it spits out the management, what exactly you need to do for that patient in the clinic. And there's no way we can get this into clinical medicine without making it simple and easy for all of you. And then finally, if you have a family that was in the family, and the genetic testing is negative, but you still know there's a genetic predisposition, you have to look at what's going on in those family members. So if they're dissecting with little to no enlargement, and your patient's there with a 4.3 aortic root, you, can, you should talk to them about going in ahead and repairing that aortic root. Um, and if you have a family that has intracranial aneurysms and thoracic aortic disease, image for the intracranial aneurysms and so on. So I just want to mention all our collaborators, um, my, a lot of people over in my lab at UT um, Houston, uh, collaborating with some of the people at Baylor, University of Washington, the Genome Center that has been doing all our, our sequencing and really grateful to many of the families that have started foundations to run, raise money, but also to many, the NH, NIH and other foundations that have been funding this research. And I just want to say that we are cl still collecting for Mac, so we'd be happy to collect patients from Methodists that we're not collecting now. And like I said, we're still having the meetings in Montalcino. This was a year ago. <laughs> and so that's a perk of, of uh, contributing to Mac. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Blue. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm a little blown away listening to you, but I'm okay. I think I've been committing all practice because we're not as engaged as we should be in doing that. And so you answered some of the questions really with that second last slide. That's the key takeaways. We see patients with big aortas all the time of all ages. And by and large, we treat them medically. We're not doing genetic testing. What's the key question? Is the key question do you, has anybody in your family had this? I'm trying to figure out how we tease out the patients you need to see versus the mass of patients that we end up seeing. I mean, you, you throw Dr. DeBakey in, they probably wouldn't have been screening Dr. DeBakey for a dissection that occurs at age 97. And so it's how do we tease out the ones that are, are most important? And what are the key clinical questions we need to ask? Um, ask about a family history, but the guidelines do say go ahead and get imaging on the first degree relatives because you will pick up other family members and one out of five patients, there'll be another family member that has an aneurysm. So, so specific examples, 65 year old man with a four and a half centimeter ascending aorta, we'd normally just follow him. You recommend that we screen all of those first degree family members. Right. Thank you. 
You don't want to miss the aneurysm because you may be managing the, your patient correctly why his brother goes on to dissect and die. Yeah. Diana, that was, that was really nice. And uh, I agree with Alan that we should collaborate more, and particularly for the genetic uh, you know, uh, issues that we're dealing with here. Um, so you recommend then to image family members of, of people who are, uh, question to you, I mean, uh, I was very impressed with the young patient who had, you know, so many uh, surgeries to prevent or, uh, you know, dilatations or dissections. The question to you, and I know we have quite a few surgeons here, is there a role for prophylactic stenting? Uh, with TGF beta uh, gene mutation. As mutation. opposed to surgery, because obviously quite a few. Um, so we hope to get that answer out of MAC. Right now, the, the recommendations are you can stent in an emergency, but otherwise open repair is preferred. And the other question to But you I think that like the patients with a later onset disease and maybe even like active two patients may do better with stenting than your Marfan patient or your, your lowest Dietz patient. So we really need to work on sorting that out. So in your opinion, and the surgeons here, do you think stenting prophylactically would, could prevent a dissection? No. I'm just thinking of the scaffolding and everything else. So, uh, la any comment? Please do. I mean, I'd say if you put a stent into a graft, that's fine. But if you're putting it into a diseased aorta, no. So, so the problem, Bill, is that all stents, you oversize them. So for example, if you've got a 35 millimeter aorta, we may end up in a 45 millimeter stent. It accelerates. The, the, they work by outward pressure. And so generally speaking, that is not what you want to do. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of these patients have already had pieces of the aorta replaced. That's what Dan's talking about now. So if there's Dacron on the top and Dacron on the bottom, and you can bridge it with a stent, and that's not a problem because the seal zones where you, are, where you need the seal are Dacron. So that's okay, but by and large, we avoid standing in these patients unless the patient's ruptured or something like that. One more question. Thank you, Alan. I mean, the field <laughs> is changing so much, particularly the genetics portion, which can you know, enlighten the management. So the question, if we send uh, to either the commercial, you know, genetic mm -hmm. testing. Are they up to date regarding all these new discoveries? That oh, absolutely. Are? They are. Uh, yeah, there's lots of com competition in that realm. So right now, genetic testing costs uh, less than an echo. It's fairly inexpensive, and you have a number of options of companies. And many of the companies, once you find the variant, they will test the family members at no cost. talked a lot about some of these um, kind of guidelines and I think we learned of uh, the medical field learned a lesson from our Turner's patients about maybe indexing aorta size oh yes because obviously yeah. you know a 4.5 centimeter in someone who's four foot ten is very different than a 4.5 centimeter in someone who's six foot three and so I wanted to get your in thoughts about you know doing you know, indexing of aorta size for these various um, genetic conditions. So there is some, uh, you know, there is recommendation for doing indexing um, in the new guidelines, both for Turner syndrome and for even other aneurysms. <coughs> it still is uh, a little barbaric that we're still using just the and the diameter to make these decisions. Now we can layer in genetics on a sub, uh, you know, a small subset of patients, but it, it's we still have a ways to go. And actually part of the Leduc is really trying, we're trying to collect these images and do um, you know, more in-depth analysis of CT images to see if we can get more information in terms of beyond just the diameter in terms of risk for dissection. Yes. Um, yeah, hi, um, great talk. 
um, Thank you. to make genetics so exciting and I feel like we have so much work to do and I agree with Alan that we, you know, we see aortic disease all the time and we, we really, we may ask about family history but maybe not send their first degree relative. So um, two questions, one, have you run into issues with like insurance in getting these, their family members uh, screened for disease? And then two, do you, have you seen like the de novo mutations you were talking about in the children? Does it seem more aggressive to you than the um, hereditary mutations? Well, I think those um, de novo mutations, um, if they're more aggressive, they're easier to identify. So it could be that a 65-year-old has a de novo mutation, but you don't think about that automatically. And then you don't have the opportunity to touch, test the parents because they're typically, you know, often not around anymore. So uh, it's not unusual the de novo mutations that tend to be the more severe end of the spectrum, just because we can find them <coughs> easier. Um, and then your other question was? In terms of screening family members, have you run into, just like in real uh, world, so you know, we always have to have get pre-authorization, and so for family members, have you had issues with insurance? We have funding? not had that much of an issue. It was in the 2010 guidelines, and it's in the 2022 guidelines, so I, I hopefully the insurance company in the balance, it will realize that it's important to do this imaging. I mean, they're, you know, pick up one and prevent one aortic dissection, they're going to be saving a lot of money collectively. A couple more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important, obviously, also for the audience besides the room to, to hear from you regarding that. One, um, I know Cindy talked about indexing. Mm -hmm. I'd like your opinion on the other side of indexing, meaning obesity is prevalent, obviously, everywhere, particularly in Houston also. So the question is the larger body surface area, if you index it, it may become smaller than what it is. And thinking about what causes conceivably stress and strain on the aorta, it really doesn't care about you know, the body surface area per se. Mm -hmm. So the question to you is a 4.3 in a body surface area of 2.5. Uh, I'm concerned about the danger of indexing in the other extreme of obesity. Right, right. So, that's so I think that. the current day says indexing to height is, is maybe better than yes. BSA. Yes. And also remember um, that uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, protects patients from aortic disease, just an FYI. We did a study of all the hospital records over five years and to look for clinical diagnoses that were associated with the diagnosis of thoracic aneurysms or dissection. The strongest hit, stronger than Marfan, stronger than BAV that I also didn't talk about, uh, was diabetes, and it was protective. And the worse the diabetes, the more protective it was. So people with diabetic complications, less likely to have aortic disease. And that's true of abdominal aortic aneurysms also. So, no idea. <laughs> Absolutely none. I, we, I have a hypothesis, <laughs> of course, which we do, I do have an NIH grant in to test that <laughs> hypothesis. <laughs> Dr. Milliwix, do you think for uh, the general cardiology community that we should be more aggressive about cross-sectional imaging in patients who undergo routine echoes for other reasons and are diagnosed with a mildly dilated aortic root? We should you go undergo more cross sectional imaging, CT, MRI of the aorta? Uh, that's a good question. The thing you may be, they may be sitting there with a small aortic root aneurysm, but a chronic type B dissection. I, um, the guidelines say once it's diagnosed that you should do a baseline CT. And the same thing if you find somebody with a mutation, do a baseline CT to make sure you're not missing something else. And I don't remember all the data to support that. And you mentioned that we should move towards gene-specific therapy 
So what, what do you think? Not therapy the management. management. The therapy yeah. still the yes, beta blockers and ARBs and yes, excuse me, yes, yeah. ma clinical management. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do you foresee that happening? Do you think we're in the right, the right pathway with uh, the most recent guidelines and what are the next steps? Uh, uh, some of it's in the guidelines. Actually, I wrote a much more extensive genetic section and they made me cut it down. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So um, not everything got in there. So we're going to write a separate, they agreed to let us write a separate guidelines on the, that it was genetic. But in the meantime, we're trying to get all this data into an app in a, a quick way that you, in a website where you can just put the data in and it spits out the management. So you don't have to go digging through the papers to figure out, or even through the treatment guidelines, which is actually difficult to search through. Like, good luck finding that table I showed you. <laughs> we have two more questions. So, uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I was truly intrigued by the genetic variants with premature aortic dissection and enlargement. Uh, of course, a significant proportion develop early on, uh, but it seems like there is a possibility that a lot of them may never develop aortic enlargement or dissection even in their 30s and 40s or even beyond. Have you thought about issues related to resilience in these individuals? The, the question uh, that's is the a other way question. around and saying why when you should have it especially yeah. and you're in your 40s and 50s you didn't develop. Are there genetic, biological processes? Yeah, this is a fascinating question and um, it's very difficult to get it environmental modifiers, maybe easier to get an environmental, but it, they're hard to collect that data. And um, genetic modifiers are very hard to find. So there's groups that are working on this, but we just want to find the rest of the genes, but really go after that 80% of dissections with no, you know, uh, no clinical risk factors um, to define that. And we want to be able to apply like machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we want to collect all of those environmental risk factors because I th still think there's mm -hmm. things in the environment that uh, we don't know about. I mean, the Cipro drugs was a big surprise to everybody. And diabetes is a protective effect, big surprise. Once again, hard to get it in a very nasty editorial saying we were wrong. <laughs> but then it's been replicated in like by four different countries around the world that this is true. But then, and then get whole genome sequencing and be able to apply, you know, new methods to really figure out that so that we're ready when we go to whole genome sequencing part of clinical medicine we're ready to pull those people at risk out of the general population and be able to manage them. Okay. Thank, thank you for the great talk. Uh, thank I'm, you. I'm specifically intrigued by the TGF beta signal. And you know, we work on TGF beta as a promoter of fibrosis in, in the heart. And it's a fine balance on if you suppress it too much, the, the mice die during induction of heart failure, which means fibrosis is needed to maintain My. stasis. And I'm intrigued by the comment that diabetes could be a protector because diabetes promotes fibrosis. Right. So my, my question is, is that a signal in these TGF mutations that individuals with the variants actually have less fibrosis compared to uh, the normal controls? Um, are they no signal that we've been able to pick up in terms of less fibrosis, but you can just look at them and their skin is thin, their sclera are blue, so you know they're not putting down the, the same amount of connective tissue. Many of them, the skin looks like your vascular EDS patients who have mutations in type 3 collagen. And so, um, and it, the ARBs actually worry me because they've been shown to block enlargement of the aorta, but there is actually a hint on the, one of the clinical trials, the largest one here in the U.S., that dissection risk went up. And that kind of makes sense because ARBs are also used to block fibrosis ultimately. And I think that's the wrong thing to be giving to the, especially the TGF beta patients. But we just, I don't have the data to support that argument. But it just, I, I, it's hard for me to put any of my TGF beta patients on an ARB. Yeah. 
Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you.